that's a that's a massive question but to and and it's only my opinion i think if i break it down into three components one is to look at it historically um, the other is the preservation of knowledge and the transmission of knowledge and then also the impact and the meaning what it means to people and communities so when we look um, in the in the art um, if i remember the book uh, correctly it's the, the the islamic calligraphy the art of heritage the one that's published by ursica in it it talks about the history so we we go from the beginning which talks about the importance of writing according to the prophet sorry salam so the historically we have um, precedence given to the act of writing. It became an art later after many years of uh, development. So, you know, the Arabs had it for about 900 years before the Ottomans took over. So it's not something that's developed so instantly and so fast. It, it's had a, a sort of like a brewing period over many, many centuries. So historically, we look at the, the writing and then from from there, we look at how the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged the act of writing. So also there was um, evidence of how trades were made. If someone could teach, um, the slaves would be free, for example. So then uh, the second why it's important is to preserve that knowledge and mainly the master student setup we have here. And it's, it's important because um, when I went to Istanbul, uh, Eftal Al Hoja, one of the first things he said to me was that the secrets of calligraphy, according to Hazrat Ali Radiallahu, is that the the master, the practice, and the spirituality. So when we look at that, and if we try to transform that into layman's terms, or the way that I see it, so the knowledge comes through your master. Of course, in history, you have exceptions where, you know, it, it's exceptions where not everyone had a master, but th those are very uh, few. And then from there, uh, the practice is the process and the training and all the awkwardness that comes with it. And this is the refinement that goes in. And then once you've got to a certain stage after all of that, then the wisdom comes from it, you know, so the actual uh, the understanding and the application, and it doesn't stop there. So these are just just the way that I understood it. So, and then the meaning, the impact is that you know what what does this this practice of calligraphy mean to individuals as a visual form, as a literal form? It's it's almost a, uh, the practice of contem contemplation. So you're looking at cultivating spirituality through. Um, you know, seeing pieces by the uh, by written in from the Quran or memorable statements, etc. So they're all reminders and harvesting something, a space, a clarity of uh, that reconnection to the sacred. So I I think that's where um, really it's it's it it became an art uh, because of certain maybe. Uh, processes that it went through, like the the ban on the printing press, uh, for, for sorry, the the alphabet revolution that came through in the Ottoman period. There was also the um, the printing press that came through, so it created a different space for artistic expression to to come forward from it. The, really, it's um, you know what I found really important with calligraphy is that there's a certain amount of wisdom that comes out of it so you know you can know calligraphy you can know fasting for example you can know how to climb mount everest you can know how to play the piano but until you've lived those experiences will you know the wisdom behind the pain the suffering the the training that's required uh, for the different elements so so that's what, what you, the lived experience is what helps you uh, understand a few things, I guess. I think um, I have a, um, there's something that um, Abdul Hakim Murad, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad said this Ramadan. And I think it's very significant because I felt that, that it's also something 
and relevant to myself. So I'm just going to quote him because I can't paraphrase him. So, so through the journey of calligraphy, he goes, we, well, we become ourselves when we transcend ourselves. Uh, not just about self-knowledge, it is about the self-knowledge that flows from a wisdom about ourselves that is only possible when we have fought with ourselves. And that this last phrase, fought with ourselves, and the calligraphy, you know, that's what I went through. I was fighting maybe with the materials, I was fighting with my personal uh, inner self, trying to bring about some qualities, maybe the environment that I was in. So you're constantly challenging uh, certain, certain aspects that you have to either develop in order to do calligraphy. If you already come into it with a certain amount of discipline and patience and you have the right characteristics, you know, you're going to flow through it. But if not, you're going to have to learn certain traits. And so you're constantly fighting, whether it's the back pain, whether it's your, you know, the noisy environment or whether the color is just not flowing, the ink is not working. It works with one paper, but it doesn't work with others. So there's all these variables that keep going on. And I think through that, I've got a better understanding of myself. You know? <laughs> so it's not, when, when I say spiritual cultivation, it's more about awareness and developing certain qualities. It isn't about saying that you're going to have these great visions and you're going to become uh, endowed with piety, etc. It's more, it's, it's knowledge about the self. And if you understand your better, the self better, then you develop certain skills which are transferable in everyday life, you know? So you, you might develop better patience or concentration or humility, for example. And these are all great qualities to have. And calligraphy is just a way of, of enhancing or making you aware of that. And also in, you know, in the Ottoman period, um, you had Sufi lodges and there were smaller circles. They weren't as big as now. I mean, calligraphy now has exploded and Istanbul seems to be like the gold rush. Everyone is, is doing it. But historically, there were very few students with each master and there was a lot more of this um, de personal development going on. And I think it trains the ego, it definitely, because you want to push your will uh, the letters won't, they won't allow it. it it's when it's everything is at its right time that you'll be able to produce that perfect letter. And this is after many years, you know, it's not like within a week, it's after six, seven, eight, and it still goes on. You know, it, it will always continue because of your life circumstances. I think Hassan Hoja said something about uh, it takes close to what, 100 years to learn? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or just, yeah, I mean, just to learn calligraphy. I think we have a question here, Gulnaz. I don't know if you are um, willing to take a question from a student. Brother okay. Zahid, you had a question, right? Because I see your hand. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What do you think about how you as a student evolved uh, in terms of the artistic side of calligraphy? as you learned and you know became more proficient so without without a doubt the visual has an impact i, I wouldn't say that uh, you you there is an attraction in the letters and even uh, i'm very self critical of my work and i've always been uh, so one of the things that i've had to deal with was this notion of perfectionism uh, but what i realized there's an inherent beauty in the letters you know, that each letter has its own rhythm and that's, that is what you're feeling when you're writing calligraphy. You're learning that rhythm through uh, your fine motor skills, through embedding that knowledge in your hand. So even though my work isn't perfect, sometimes I have uh, good days, sometimes I don't, but somehow I seem to like my Karalama practice. <laughs> and <laughs> that it's not, it's not because I'm a great calligrapher. It's just because there's an inherent beauty that uh, that lies within these letters, and you know when you work with um, when you work as you progress, you know. So you're you're two years in, depending. It's relative on your time uh, commitment. You know whether you have a full time job. But if you were in Istanbul and you were doing it uh, continuously, so like five years down the line, 
you would start having more detailed conversations with your master about compositions and uh, color inks and it's a preference after your jazz or what some people prefer to stick to the tradition and work with black others are exploring with inks um, but I will I will say that beauty will only attract uh, eyes but the personality is what captures the hearts and this is what yeah I think Hassan Hoja is a great example of that where you know his his um his personality is coming through his calligraphy work. And when you meet somebody like Hassan Hoja, you feel it in his presence and you can see that this is years of refinement. It isn't, um, again, uh, there's no shortcuts, so it isn't coming overnight. It's not coming within a few weeks. This is constant, constant um, you're constantly striving to produce the perfect letter. And you know what? it'll never be perfect in your eyes because you can always see something more beautiful that's coming through it. So, you know, it, it, it's developed into beautiful art forms now. So, and you see that in many books and compositions. When you go to Istanbul, it's everywhere. It, it's very much part of everyday life. You see it in the mosques, you see it on um, graveyards, you see it everywhere. So it, I think because we're in the West, we're a little bit isolated from that. But when you're within a great culture that's developed art in such a way, you'll see it, you see it everywhere on the street. So you're constantly surrounded by beauty. I, I think that it depends on your on the level that is within the group. So I'm not sure. You might already have gone past it. But I think um, something. In the something I do in my courses is that I also try to develop habits in students. Mm -hmm. And something that's inspired me was the story of Sheikh Hamdullah, his 40 day seclusion of uh, his pieces. So I set my students a 40 day, 40 minute, 40 day challenge. I, I've classed it as that, but it's really inspired by Sheikh Hamdullah. So around about three weeks into the course, I, I, tell, I set them this challenge where I say that you need to spend 40 minutes every day for 40 days. And if you're able to accomplish that, then it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, you, sometimes people have the difficulty of sitting. So if you enjoy it so much, but you have difficulty sitting, you, you need to address that first because calligraphy is long hours of sitting. And so some students who have tried that have seen, it's also like a, a mental confidence um, aspect for them as well, because uh, in eight weeks, if you don't practice, you won't see your progress. But if you sit there for 40 days, and even if it means just working on two letters for 40 minutes every day, they themselves have seen that progress, the few students that have, that have tried it. So that's something I would encourage everyone, you know, is to get into the habit of sitting regularly and to be consistent with it. So once you, with the view of increasing that. For mothers, I guess, um, because I think a lot of times, you know, as, as a mother, people want to know how I'm managing the two. Um, there's something that I tried with my children uh, was that I sat, I wanted them to introduce this idea of training, how everything needs certain practice. So I said that we were going to have a calligraphy lesson. So I set the same time every day and they, they sat with me and they, they played with the columns, they wrote, the, wrote with the columns. But what that did, uh, sitting down at the same time every day for like 30 minutes, what that did was create that space of uh, mentally knowing that this time is dedicated to calligraphy. So it's, they stuck with it for 10 days with myself, but then they learned that that time was a calligraphy lesson. So sometimes they would, sometimes they would watch me and be cheeky and push my arm a little bit. And, you know, so just so that it would smudge a little bit. In, in their minds and also in my mind that that time that was set every day at the same time, uh, you know, it created the space. So then you start to evolve your time around, I need to cook before that, or I need to get the kids their routine done so that we can all sit down as a family and just, just move the column, just to keep that uh, practice going. And I think also um, 
your intention, your prayer. I, I can't stress that enough. You know, to to relax, you need to do things before you start calligraphy. You should find ways to relax yourself because, you know, in all honesty, you need at least an hour to warm up before um, you actually start writing. You know, because you're you're trying to get to to bring all everything together to write those perfect letters. So if you're traveling, for example, if you're working and you're traveling, you've just come off the tube. You know, there, there is a certain amount of stress, so you have to de-stress yourself a little. So be aware of your physical, your mental, your, you know, your environment and, and address those before you even begin writing, because otherwise the, the frustration is misplaced. It may not be your writing, it may be something that's uh, troubled you mm -hmm. um, beforehand. So I, I would say, you know, um, you know, when I was in Istanbul, I was, I was, you know, reading two rakats of prayer before I began. I can't do that now, but doing, you know, if you can to do would do just to to for the water element to to wash away uh, your, you know, just to to cleanse yourself a little bit, or or have a shower, or or if you like to listen to classical music or something that will um, relax you to prepare you to start your practice that prayer in whichever way you want because you want it, it's not an easy task and it's it's um it will take time and you do need to persevere um the beauty about being in istanbul is that you have everybody uh in a similar boat you can constantly uh talk to each other but when you're isolated a little bit it's more difficult to get that same kind of inspiration by yourself so I think what you know what you've done with uh, scripts and scribes and set up a little community, it's perfect. It's you know recreating that environment in the states, and it it will certainly help. I have two setups. I have the official setup, which is where I uh, do my writing. And then I have a setup in the kitchen, which is just columns and papers that are just ready there. So really you're, you're scraping for minutes wherever you can, you know, whether it's you're sitting down and the kids are coloring and you just pull out a paper, but that, that practice is there as, a, as just to keep your hand going. It's not the idea to produce something perfect. It's not, it's more to keep with the rhythm and not to forget some of the, the learning that you have. So you, you're constantly reminding, retraining yourself all the time. So I think that, you know, we we were encouraged to keep our meshs with us. We were following the teacher. So I'm not saying stalk Aisha, but you know, where if <laughs> we're <laughs> so we're you know, we carried stuff with us just in case that at an exhibition, the, the you know, our, our masters might have a few minutes or that they, they would be able to glance. So you want to be carrying these, um, these tools around with you, uh, located so that it's not an effort of, I have to pick it up and set it up. It's already there. Okay. And then the other, the, I would say, learn to write in all environments. You're not going to have the perfect environment all times, especially as a mother, because you're constantly trying to get into the routine and rhythm, and which changes constantly with smaller children. And so, so what, whatever you can, whenever you can, and and something that Hassan Hodja told us, which really sticks with me, he says that. I, th I think it's more of an inspiration kind of love um, that he was referring to was that when you when you feel the urge to write, then try to stop everything and capture that moment because in that moment, um, you know you, you you're learning something that it, it's um, it's it's that inspiration to to write. So whether you can write your perfect letters, let go of that uh, idea that I'm, I'm, I have to write perfectly. Mm -hmm. The idea is to, to, uh, to write, that's, that's the first step. Where we have to get into the habit of writing in all environments as possible. And the, the other thing that I think we have to distinguish when we talk about practice is progress. So a lot of people want to know 
when can they see progress? Mm -hmm. And so if you want to practice for the sake of the beauty, then any amount of time in the day is good for you. But if you want to uh, study and practice calligraphy to compete in competitions, then you know you you're looking at uh, eight hours, fourteen hours a day. This is what the, those uh, top-notch calligraphers are doing at the beginning. So, so what is your intention, and where do you want to go with the calligraphy? So, when when I first started, we asked Hassan Hodja, and he said thirty hours, and then he <laughs> smiled. So, so we we all know that that that's his his way of highlighting the seriousness and commitment required to undertaking calligraphy. Then a few few years later we are you know the conversation came up again and he said it's like a full-time job so you you want to spend eight hours a day on it and then he said that if you are very talented maybe you just need four so it's really for the students to check themselves you can practice anytime anywhere but if you want to perform which is like producing final pieces then you really need to up those hours to you know eight eight plus four at least a day to to be able to match some of the standards in uh, Istanbul. So it, it's really down what what's what do you want to do with calligraphy and where where do you want to take it? Will define the the level of practice and progress you see with it. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize, Anika, is that this advice was given to us at a particular state, uh, mm -hmm. a particular time, a particular state, um, and also. So it was very personal to us at that time. And, and you have to be careful when you generalize it to everybody because okay. uh, it's really important to look at your, you know, for example, I, I have had students with mental health issues, for example. So if I say to them that you, you need to practice eight hours a day, that it's going to stress them out. So you, you have mm -hmm. to be careful also when we're um, spreading this idea that if you really want to do it you can do it because it really depends on your internal state whether you have a stable environment whether it's physically or mentally or you know do you have the right setup uh, do you have a, 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 the right support do you have childcare in place do you do you have the money to have childcare in place do you have to work so so it's really important to find a good master and work with them because they will guide you according to your state, basically. Because mm. we, you know, by now we can understand, uh, pick up certain nuances and we can see uh, how, how well they'll do. And so I, I just really want to clarify that because a lot of people do want to do it but there might be some issues that are progressing. So it's start with little and work mm -hmm. with that and then build, build upon that because mm -hmm. there'll be a point where it's, it's, it just comes together and you can increase your hours. And, mm -hmm. you know, over the few, last few years, I've been working part-time on it. I, I just couldn't afford childcare, for example, and, and I'm not around family. So I've inbuilt it within um my lifestyle my circumstances and there's a point where you just have to accept that's it and and mm -hmm. that's also something about calligraphy you, ha you have to accept the moment if you've tried hard you've done everything and it's still not going in the direction that you want it to go then you know that that you have to surrender to that moment and say that this is the best i can do uh, at this stage with the view of trying to improve later